Colin, talk to me. What do you guys got going on over at Tofi? What's news? Oh, man. Well, I just put out a little bit of a teaser here. We are uh, bringing up some of our community members who are starting testing uh, some of our internal functions here. Um, our DEX uh, is about 98% done um, now to be ready for our mainnet release. Um, we're going on to Capsule, our NFT marketplace, making sure that that's optimized and ready to go cross-chain on Eclipse. Um, and then uh, introducing Game Loop V2 to the greater world. We're really, really excited. We've been uh, hard crunching. <laughs> I love it, man. I love that. Love hearing that. Hell yeah. Things going. Yo, I saw some. I saw some crazy statistics or some crazy stats there. I think it was Avax that was running a space. Did they really have seventy-seven thousand people in there? Eh, I see. I see the recordings of these spaces all the time. I generally think a lot of those are overinflated numbers. Um, I, I find it a little shocking to see seventy-seven thousand people in a niche topic are going to join in on a space and be there live, right? You know, like, look, look, the biggest Twitch streamers don't really have 77,000 people live watching them. I don't think a niche blockchain is going to also get those That's numbers in. So, you know, um, so I, I, you know, I definitely think there was a base there of several thousand. Uh, but, you know, the, the those numbers are kind of, you know, I, I don't know how much I believe. I think a lot of those are too are just people that went back and listened to the, like the recording. And like, even if they just listened to like a part of the recording, it still like counts them in the tally as listeners. Yeah, and I mean, we all know how bad bots are on this platform, right? I, I think it's really easy just to fill out a space, you know, get, get a bot farm in Indonesia out there and, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll have 25,000 people listening to this space with like, you know, however many real humans actually listening. That's my litmus test for the entire industry is how many bots do I have to block on a daily basis? Oh, fuck. It's never ending, bro. It's never ending. You can't block them as fast as they come out. Yo, did you guys see Kyle? I am trying to get Kyler's ass in here. Did you guys see Kyler's uh, video with Niger? He signed Niger, Niger Houston to Pog. That was pretty dope. I did see that, dude. That's dope. Good for him, man. That's a, that's a dope, dope partnership. Hopefully it all works out and like everything goes smoothly. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, sorry for being a little bit late. Um, nice. How's everyone doing today? You're good, KNG. What's going on with you, man? Uh, pretty good. Um, I, I'm uh, basically building like the first decks on uh, on IMX and as well as Launchpad. Uh, we just did our test net um, on Friday. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned bots. So we saw like around 15,000 customers basically came in during those three days. But when I decided to go and check into like the unique IP addresses, I think it's safer to say we had 7,000 customers real. So it's it's very important to distinguish these things, you know, but it seems seem like people are interested. I just saw Triverse signed to IMX, so that's supposed to be like the game of the season, all right? So hopefully that as well. Go for it, Taco. <clears throat> Yo, what is up, folks? Great topic. Definitely interested in what we have today. King, you touched on something pretty cool. So uh, you will notice this trend every time there's a new protocol or project launched. There are a ton of folks in this space that have learned that there will probably be some sort of airdrop at some point. Therefore, let me get in on that, interact with that at the early stage because I might earn, earn or own some sort of token later. Uh, I'm assuming that's what happened with your protocol launch. Uh, yeah, so we are currently um, we are currently running on a, a points farming uh, project uh, system. So basically, if you try our product on testnet, which is right now free because it's all testnet tokens, you can earn some points. Uh, what we have done, which I think it's pretty unique it, uh, in terms of Dex, is basically say like actions in the room, right? So actions sign up under my referral link. Um, I get half of actions points and whoever action refers, I get 25% of his referral points. So basically it's a good way for like creators to like promote, like, um, what's it called? This new gaming decks. And right now we are like, we've already signed like agreements with like Kierverse, um, uh, block Lords and uh, a couple others. I'm trying to remember. How the did that meeting go today? Oh, uh, sorry, I I had I actually I had a uh, yeah Wagney was re very good. My CEO he he said it was amazing. They, they just want to check out our tech stack, but they're very interested. So awesome. yeah. So I gave you a thumbs down when he first said that you're building something. He's not building anything, guys. He already built it. He's just testing it out, making sure that it's robust enough for people to use. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I just got to use that thumbs down button so that when Dave is reviewing the space, he's like, "Who's giving thumbs down on my space?" 
Like fucking clockwork yeah. every time. It's, Sorry, Kenji. Yeah, it's already built. Um, we have had like um, surprisingly, the, we originally were thinking that max only a thousand people would join the test net. Um, but it came so big that we ran into like issues where like our dashboard wasn't updating fast enough, and people were like, "Where's my points? Where's my points?" And I'm like, "Everything is stored." And a backend server that I personally download to my PC every single day to make sure that like nothing happens. Uh, all your points are saved. But um, I think what makes IMX kind of unique is that um, their pass uh, their you can use their wallets. I prefer MetaMask because I I prefer a self custody wallet. But they have a custody wallet with them where you just have to give your email and basically um. Basically, you can uh, transact in their blockchain, including working with our decks with just your email load. So we had a lot of customers that um, I would say about 10% of our user base uh, just sign up with their email and and they prefer that. They don't want even want to think about a seed phrase. I mean, each to their own. I prefer self-custody, but, you know, it's the first self-custody decentralized tool application, I would say. Got it. But yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I did a little bit of work for IMX uh, in the last bear market, a ton of really cool tools for uh, the normal audience. Um, my question is, like, knowing that uh, there is a part of this uh, user base, your ideal target customer that recognizes there's something to earn potentially for taking part in your ecosystem, how, how are you going to mitigate, mitigate like these bot farms and civil attacks and stuff? Because it is a big issue. We see this in the gaming space. We see this with airdrops uh, and you're also going to see this. Like, is there a way to like uh, stand against this if you're a project founder or somebody so, launching? So we are actually, um, yes and no. Like I can filter out every single um, every single block form, but um, uh, what I can do is um, so for for people that sign up to our Discord and link through their wallet, they're getting more points. So what I can do is like mathematically drown out the noise, and since it's a point based system, give like those block forms nothing could. So like <laughs> if they if they decide to if they decided to like bot form and they don't even give us their discord they're going to get much lesser points so then um <clears throat> so then basically the form might not even be worth it like imagine you spend like three thousand dollars on a on a farm and then you only collect five dollars in airdrops like you know but we have been we have been running like bot protection where we've been trying to find like like patterns within things that are happening so it has been working, but we have clearly have seen like we had our own faucet at one point for IMS test tokens, and I I think there was like two thousand bots that just was just trying to claim the test tokens and not doing anything with it. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Those tokens are useless. They're test tokens. So each to their own. Hey, bro, I'm swapping all those test tokens for all that for all that testing, Matic, bro. Can't wait. I'm gonna be rich. <laughs> Maybe, maybe that's actually a thing. Who knows? I know Gory E was valued at ten dollars at one point. <laughs> Wait, so what? ridiculous. How much <clears throat> how much? I got I got girly ETH and I got Sapolia ETH. What do we need? who needs who needs to be? Uh, Lair Zero had uh, created a market pay, uh, place for that. So I think at one point it was worth like ten bucks. Yeah, oh yeah, that's exactly where I got it from. Is this are you saying the pool's not there anymore? <laughs> Hit me up if anybody needs girly either support you. Like right, a hundred of each. <laughs> and I'm saying them when 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 like when the full bowl season come out and everybody wants to test their stuff on testnet, there's like a very big demand for that to the point that people actually pay for testnet tokens. Really? Okay. Yeah, I think it's up ten dollars for a whole day because there was a little a bit of a Twitter narrative last year about oh my god, Gorilla ETH is now a real token. It uh, it was a fun meme play, I think. It's nice to feel rich for a little bit. You imagine seeing two hundred ETH in your wallet? I don't know. I have no idea what the hell that feels like. But goddamn, do I want to know what that feels like? Shit. All one right. day. One day. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Um. All right. I need you guys to fill me in on some stuff because there was a couple things that launched. Obviously, um, something called Lion City. Uh, there was a it was a sandbox game. Anybody? 
apparently it was like some new gaming experience um nothing yeah that one didn't seem like it was gonna hit anyway um the on the so did you mean sandbox is in a type of gameplay say that again uh, was it on the sandbox metaverse sandbox or was it a sandbox gaming experience um i will tell you right why am i seeing jonah blake newsletter ads everywhere right now oh my gosh um it was you know how do you even read these sites man there's ads everywhere holy cow this is crazy it says a new gaming experience called lion city has been launched in the sandbox game does that mean a gaming experience or in the game oh that's in the game so that would be yeah. in the meta box metaverse okay copy this is also news on uh Web3 Gaming will onboard up to 100 million gamers in the next two years. And then it said, this statistic was interesting, 40% of Web3 games currently in development are expected to go live in the next 12 to 18 months. Those are predictions by Polygon and the Immutable. Uh, yeah. I, I believe in that because um, I'll try and find you in our in our pitch deck. Um, we've coded like PwC, which is like a, um, a research firm for like like businesses going to. And, they, and they've already pointed that. So what... They're, those guys are extracting. It's like they're like, okay, what can if we if we can grab like five percent of the market share of gaming, how much will we get? So those numbers could be slightly higher, um, depending. But I think what's going people are going to notice there's you're going to see games on Ubisoft, Epic, and Steam, and they just happen to have a backend support system for crypto. You unless you're a crypto bro, you probably won't notice it, but um, but that's what they're probably meaning. Isn't Steam like? I mean, isn't Steam like? Steam doesn't allow like any kind of block. Yeah, yeah. Steam does not allow any kind of blockchain games on their platform. Uh, but he's totally right about the other gaming publishers, and I, I think that that is. I mean, we've covered this a few in, a little bit in the other spaces we've done. Uh, but I think that is going to be the uh, general onboarding process. <clears throat> the vast majority of Web two users are going to be playing normal games in, in normal gameplay loops without even realizing that there's you know Web three implementations or you know uh, player owned assets implementation. Um, until they're you know venturing into the actual space themselves. That's the only way we're going to hit 100 million users this cycle. I mean, let's be 100% real, right? Uh, we need the experiences that are going to justify bringing these people into our space. Um, and I think uh, until we have a lot more of these, you know, I, I don't want to say AAA because we're not, not, I'm not talking about budget, but AAA in terms of eyeballs and, uh, you know, attractive enough gameplay loops to really maintain and hold a player base. Um, you know, we got to see a lot more of these titles come out before we're ready to, uh, you know, really be optimistic about incoming player base loads coming in this cycle. I don't even think it needs to be a triple A game, honestly speaking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's why I said like not AAA when it comes down to budgets. Uh, AAA when it comes down to attention and eyeballs, right? The amount of people who are interested in that experience, that's what I mean by AAA. You're talking tens of millions of people have heard about it, tens of millions of people are interested in it. It could be an Undertale-level indie game made by a single guy. That's still, you know, AAA level of attention. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, like, I think even PAL Worlds, their budget was $7 million over three years. Which is like, <laughs> like pretty very crypto reasonable. Of crypto. Yeah, <clears throat> that's that's pretty damn reasonable. I mean, they made that back in the first three hours of game sales alone. Just saying. What else we got? Fortnite. Uh, this is this is what caught my this is what caught my attention as I'm reviewing oh, these headlines. Yeah, Unreal editor for Fortnite and the creator economy 2.0. Yeah, Taco, go for it. Dude, this is something that's really awesome, and I, I, I'm actually dying to get started. I've been uh, negligent of not jumping into it. I come from the game design space years ago. I'd love to get back into it. So it's a simplified bunch of tool sets for anybody to go and create. I say anybody. It takes a little bit of technical skill to go and create in a gaming environment in which uh, users are already in a, well, captivated. It's a captive audience of some 300, 400 million users. It's a very easy top funnel for somebody looking to get into the gaming space and that's why i think it's important I, I wish a lot more web3 startups and web3 games took that seriously because it is so underrated right now the competition is not very high uh, i have friends that have created uafn maps and you know they're making five figures pretty high five figures a month 
from just the user flow and turnover from this map that they've created. It's nuts. I believe you. Um, I believe you. If uh, like side note on that, um, I was reading an interesting article. Snoop Dogg has actually created a VC fund. I think it's only like three to five million dollars, and it's specifically focused on Fortnite, uh, the Fortnite system. Basically, he, he's investing in people to like um, to build out these custom Fortnite games, and he's taking basically like a sixty percent cut. So the dude is actually making his money back probably within the first month, if I had to guess, at these figures, plus his name and brand recognition to go against it. Yeah, well, that's very clever. Um, I'm also seeing like influencers from the social space, YouTubers, uh, Twitch streamers that have a large audience step into the UEFN space because they know they have, let's say, a 50,000 active audience. If you can get that engaged in your game, that's a nice chunk of change you're earning uh, through UEFN just from royalties and folks playing that game. It's your own audience anyway. It's a really cool monetization of an audience. UEFN? Define? Yes, Real Engine Fortnite Editor. Ah, Unreal Engine Fortnite editor. And how much are we talking? Like when you say if you have a, uh, an audience of let's say fifty thousand, like what are we looking at? I'll run the numbers for you. Bear, bear with me just a second. He's a taco who runs the numbers. I love it. Look at this, fantastic. Um, yeah, Brad. Anything on the uh, on the you said on the Fortnite creator? You said you loved it. Yeah, dude. I got to dive back into it. I checked it out when it first launched, and I was like, oh, this like needs to get jumped up on my list of shit to do. Like, and then you know work and other projects and you know like add get distracted while halfway through coding something it's like oh, what's that though and like you know start playing with that and there's a lot going on right now in web3 and uh so i've been really kind of digging into some of the deeper things on that side but dude i need to i need to get into it because I, I play shit i mean i play at least one or two games every night you know um and it's a way that like my brother and i play he lives in philly and so like we'll get on and play like a game of duos you know and things like that and uh I mean, my kiddo loves the new Lego Fortnite stuff. So, I mean, like, there's, it's such a huge, huge audience. And, uh, yeah, I gotta, I just have to dive in and really figure out, like, how to build a map, like, correctly and not just, you know. So, let me ask you something, Brett, because you, you just mentioned the kiddo, right? And I, this is another story that came across this week was, um, Epic, uh, they're creating something called cabined accounts for kids in the metaverse. I don't know if y'all have heard about this before. So they introduced cabined accounts, and essentially it's it's a new way for, let's say, for like your, your kids to feel safe or join the metaverse and making sure that their experience, it's like in a more, like I guess, controlled and like a younger environment. How do you guys feel? Like, are you guys, like, are they... I guess I, I don't have children, so like anybody that has kids, like, like speak on it, that plays like some of these Fortnite games, like, are you, do you feel comfortable? Do you feel safe with them in there? Like, what's the story? So, like, what it boils down to, and it's something that I had to deal with a lot um, with, with Pepsi when we were talking about entering in Roblox, um, and it, it's called COPA Compliance, and it's a Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And uh, essentially, that's, like, those boxes that it's, like, click this box to prove you're over 13 years old, you know? And anybody who can work a mouse or a touchpad can click yes. You know I mean? So, right. There's a there's a funny uh, there's a funny uh, uh, episode of Silicon Valley about a specific subject, and I think for each failure to compliance is like sixteen thousand dollars. So it's a way. I know for exactly. I know the yeah. exact episode you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> so, so it's a great, great. Yeah, it's yeah, a great yeah, example cool. of like it's the same what reason why uh, that uh, like those chat um those chat uh applications shut down is because they aren't COPA compliant so and all those events that happened they're like sixteen thousand dollars sixteen thousand dollars so you can end up with like like a hundred million dollar fine theoretically speaking um, easily easily and then, so, and then a lot of these ceos can be held personally liable as well um because correct. it can be seen as malfeasance uh it, it's a really interesting thing I, i'll be honest Whenever we're talking about gaming environments that are trying to create a more child-oriented space, big, big red, uh, red alarm bells fly off in my head. Um, I've been part of the internet here for long enough where I know the predators and the people that we're scared about interacting with these kids. To me, that is a magnet to them. Um, and I'd like to see what forms of actual protection that they're doing uh, to create these safer spaces for children. I'm also a little hesitant away from any company actively advertising and trying to recruit a under 13 audience playing their game i, I think that that is also a you know a, a potential recipe for uh for a, a bad time 
Yeah, it's like, uh, well, I think the best example I can think of for right now is VR Chat. Like, VR Chat was like, I remember that was the first thing I downloaded when I got my first VR. And originally, it was very grown adults. I even remember, uh, I, I even remember there was um, one gentleman, he told me he was making six figures a year running a VR Chat strip club. Right? Now, <laughs> fast forward three years from now, right? I bought the brand new meta glasses, right? Going to VR chat. I'm hearing like 10 year old kids. And now I'm like, is VR chat even corporate compliant now that I'm thinking of it? So, yeah, well, very I, interesting. I, I think Rec Room. Yeah, and Rec Room, the other VR chat program, I think is the predominant one where most of the kids are focused. And at least for me, a lot of the advertisements I've seen are very much, you know, middle school uh, kind of focused advertisements for these kids. And it's, it's really nerve wracking in, in, in one sense, if you're a game and you can carve out a safe space for children and you can offer a real experience, you've cornered a market that no one else can corner. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're playing with fire. Um, and, and, and I'd be nervous about any project that's like heavily, especially in a Web3 context, heavily put, uh, pushing towards very young, young audiences. I think there's already enough regulatory scrutiny on us. I don't think we need more re regulatory scrutiny. Go for it, Taco. Yeah, so do you, I mean, a lot of us are here in here are quite young. Some of us are a little bit older. Like we might rem remember that era in history where we used to be told constantly, uh, be cautious online in this internet space. You need to protect your kids. There's certain protocols that you need to follow. There's conversations you need to have. Be safe online. Don't do all these types of things. Well, I don't see a reason why that doesn't extend into the metaverse or Twitter or a VR or any uh, of these other online immersive experiences. I think we've just forgotten those conversations and perhaps as parents, we've also forgotten that there is this other side to the interwebs. We used to be told about it and I think we kind of need to bring those conversations back. I, I, I think you're totally right. I'm thinking specifically the onus and the issue that falls into this is on direct projects or direct, you know, companies marketing towards these children. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I'm a little bit older. I, I'm, I'm in my late twenties now. I remember the days, you know, when I was 10 years old playing Halo 3, playing Halo 3s and, uh, you know, completely losing my shit in lobbies and yelling at other people and all of that. You know, it's, it's, it's a big difference between a mature rated game that has kids playing it versus a, you know, a game that's designed and marketed towards kids themselves. Um, I think that that is just the line that I don't know if we want to cross as an industry. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's that's taking advantage perhaps in some way. Um, I want to quickly get back to the topic of earnings on UEFN. So, quickly, just running some uh, you know pancake math here. Um, Shroud on Twitch has some eleven million followers. Uh, often, is any one of his streams on any given day has about fifty thousand live viewers, and this could be at random. So, let's say he can um, in a day move uh, anything between 50,000 to 100,000 folks to play one of his maps, he could be earning about 300 to $500 a day just from that one map. So you can kind of do the numbers. And that's very passively. 10 million audience, if you can get 30,000 plays a day, that's not a lot. So just the play? Like, what, do they have to make purchases? Like, like what's the story? No, just this. Just play the game, spend time in, in game interacting, whatever your game loop is. It's it's a, it's not a straightforward calculation, but uh, yeah. And so 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 basically, Epic Games now is essentially paying these map creators, you know, uh, ad revenue, like like you know, monetizing the amount of time that these users are spending in the experience. It's very interesting. I'm wondering where the capital is going to come out, you know, for this program in a in a longer term perspective. You know, obviously there's a float the float in here in the mid midterm, but Unless they're planning on injecting ads, which, you know, again, <laughs> as Team brought up, brings up a whole other aspect of co uh, COPA issues. Um, you know, I, I, I think that that is, uh, you know, going to be very interesting. Uh, you know, Epic Games historically has always been a company. I've been very, very curious on how they continuously produce an immense amount of profits utilizing this single player free to play game. I think, I think, like, as a, as a bit, like, as like, um, as a business owner, I think the first solution is mass adoption, create your moat of customers, and then do stuff like ad revenue, um, uh, buy, uh, pay, uh, pay systems and stuff like that. So th their shareholders are probably like, yeah, we're, we're definitely okay with it. 
as long as you guys can show 20% year over year growth. For sure, for sure. I'm just wondering what that end goal of monetization is. Um, you know, I, I do see a world where, you know, they allow creators to, you know, either start selling their maps or start selling cosmetic within those maps. And then it's a Steam rev share type system. I think the way that really Epic has become very, very successful is they're just unbelievable partnerships that they've done, you know, and integrated, you know, custom skins and things like that into their games. You know, I mean, like it was, I think, six months ago, maybe now or so that they, you know, partnered with Futurama, which is like one of yeah. my favorite shows ever, you know, and I was like, yo, I'm buying the battle pass and paying the 10 bucks or whatever it is to get the stars and whatever, whatever, like just so I can get these skins. It's like, so you're hey, saying interoperability is really valuable in a gaming sense to get back yeah, on the web three side. <laughs> yeah, I can take that skin across everything and like just hell it yeah, port it over to like Halo on you know and go rock that throughout a Halo match. That'd be hilarious, you know. Like, there's all sorts of really cool things I think that could be done with the owning of those assets. It's really just getting the different game developers and game studios to play nicely in the same sandbox. I think you hit the nail on the head with that. Um, what's it called? There are protocols like there's one called Mud written by Optimism that is specifically designed to bring assets from different video games into their system. Uh, it's just figure out, figuring out like a revenue system that benefits everyone. Um, uh, I'm not really in the bu business of that. I'm more like um, in the business of like trying to like offer the ability to swaps and stuff like that. But there's definitely, if somebody can figure out a good revenue model and a good, and that already have these licensing agreements, they tend to make a lot of money. For sure. I, I also think, you know, just from an interoperability standpoint, at least in a Web3 context, I'm not talking Web2, um, it really comes down to the infrastructure that's being provided by these chains, right? Um, you know, I'm not going to shill or anything like that, but, you know, that, that's one of the major things I think is really important as these companies are building in specific, you know, either subnets or, you know, blockchains here. Um, we need to be focusing on how we, uh, you know, how we can share player-owned assets between experiences, um, and that's going to come in from a, you know, even framework and an even, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure that everyone is, you know, building off of. Um, so we have the same foundations. Happy. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you guys are on to something really cool here. I'm going to go back to the Epic Games conversation. So like this, it's a company that has no shortage of cash. I mean, 2018, gross income, $3.7 billion. It tailed down slowly up until last year, which was the lowest, but still pretty substantial, $720 million. Like, you know, there, there's no shortage here. They've got a really big audience. Um, I think Fortnite alone has some 300 or 400 million active monthly players. So they're obviously leveraging that. And I think, King, you touched on something really clever. Like, this is just a, a build spend. So they can monetize several million dollars a month to get creators and users and uh, artists and game designers to step into their ecosystem, tap into their audience. Very much the same strategy that uh, Roblox spent decades trying to get to. But I think you're going to see that fast forwarded in sort of 16 speed. Uh, with Fortnite because they have the audience, they have the financial capital, they have the creators, they have the gamers, they've captivated the audience, they're always already the top of the town. They can do that sort of 10 times better and, and quicker with newer engines and all the rest of the bells and whistles. Um, something else, so we kind of tend to forget, like we use this word metaverse, but in my opinion, like Fortnite already is that. It's got tons of different game modes, loads of player economies, tons of reach across all the world, different languages, communities, time zones, consoles. Uh, it's got its own creative engine. There's all sorts of gaming experiences that exist within it. And they've made a shift into the blockchain Web3 NFT space. I think it was one of the first or the most well-known uh, gaming platforms to be open to NFTs and Web3. So there's definitely a, a, a narrative there that we can say they're probably going towards what we consider a metaverse, although in the normal world, they're probably already there. That, uh, uh, that's really interesting. I usually think of metaverse as being more, uh, you know, rec room, um, you know, a, a VR chat, these kind of platforms that, you know, serve as a common congregate, you know, congregate area here for users. And then they can go off into different gameplay experiences directly through that base level experience. I'll Do you think that that's something that, you know, Fortnite's looking to incorporate into, you know, their quote unquote metaverse? 
I mean, I would think so, absolutely. So if you look at how UEFN operates, you can essentially have one character skin, one model, or one one sort of setup, and just use that in a bunch of different games, assuming uh, those map creators allow you to use your character from previously. So now you just have to tie into that the Win3 element. It's, it's almost there. I think it's just one or two steps away. It's, it's not a big stretch of the imagination at this point. Yeah, exactly. The season in Fortnite, you can earn skins for Rocket League by playing Fortnite. You know, and just literally use the skins that you earn in Fortnite for your Rocket League cars. Yeah, you know, it's just like it, because because they make both games. You're staying inside their ecosystem. It's real easy for them to point shit at a different server. You know, and uh, you know, yeah, we're we're so close, so close to being able to actually integrate some sort of Web three ownership. If you guys want, sure. To I mean, <clears throat> sorry, sorry. Go ahead, King. I've interrupted you. Sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, if you guys want some serious a metaverse alpha. Look up the term digital twins. It's uh, Nvidia already started hiring for uh, hiring for uh, this position, and um, in real life, I'm a communications engineer, and this is like the number one topic that we have set for the next three years. And Facebook has already started hiring for this topic as well because they need to prepare for their um, XR servers that they're going to start to release. I think sometime next year. So look up the term. You'll be shocked. I don't want to spoil it for any digital twins. And it is right now. It only has business applications, but it is. Uh, it is the. It's basically think about it. This once you look up the term, figure. Imagine putting that into a game like GTA, and you'll be and you'll be shocked. For sure. Um, now, I, I, I want to quickly just go back to the metaverse topic that we were talking about there, because, you know, uh, both BSN, Golden Taco, and uh, Bread Bites here, um, both of you guys brought up metaverse examples. And what I heard was like, you know, uh, uh, two different conjointed uh, gameplay experiences, right? Using the example of Fortnite and um, and uh, Rocket League. Um, and then also, uh, you know, talking about, you know, being able to interoperability, move assets between these two different experiences. At least to me, in my understanding of a metaverse, um, I'm thinking almost like a in-game hangout zone. Um, think of it like a have a hotel club penguin type scenario uh, with different realms that load out into different gameplay experiences. So it's not so much about, you know, different games being able to be interoperable, uh, imp- you know, interoperable with each other. It's far more about having you know a social collection zone within a web w- w- within a you know gameplay space and then allowing users within that collection spot in that gameplay space to then bridge out to different gameplay experiences so you know a metaverse in the example of uh fortnite and rocket league would be some kind of hangout zone where users of both of those games can congregate together and then go off and load into fortnite and load into uh rocket league you know directly through that metaverse experience is that something that you think is going to be coming down the pipeline for a you know epic games or an epic ecosystem uh type experience 100 percent, i agree with that that statement i think you hit the nail on the wall like not every gamer wants to play the same type of game and forcing them to conceive to that game style metaverse is not a realistic from a profitability style point and for just a user acquisition but having a having a system in place where you can do cross-brand correlation with like the main company then that's that's I see that could be a big revenue driver um, in terms of metaverse like uh, uh, what's it called you could convince people to try out different types of products that normally wouldn't do something like that so yeah I hundred percent agree with that yeah I I, I I think that that is the future right almost like a uh, you know a, a ready player one you know that, that that's the way that I'm thinking and that's the way that I see metaverses i mean you know if, if anything that is just an overused word that means absolutely nothing anymore um but but you know the uh, original thesis and concept of what a metaverse is to me that's what it is is it's it's a core collection zone that allows you to go experience other games um you know outside of that metaverse but all going through that metaverse as the initial you know uh, uh, foundation i have a question for you guys have you ever heard of the company called cavernous No, I've, I've I've heard I'm I've heard of the name. I can't bring up a I can't bring up their business though on top of my head. Yeah, I, I'm I'll, I'll pin up their site because I'm always curious about this. And Thomas just put this down. They said Cavernous is building with Epic Games and one of their biggest funding partners. Digital Twins is a major part. KNG, like, can you give us kind of the simplified version of what like Digital Twin is? Because I'm looking at it, it sounds kind of it sounds really fucking crazy. It sounds crazy. Okay, so 
so to give you a background of what I do, I'm I I held a couple patents in RF communications, and I have I did my master and possibly soon to be PhD thesis in communication theory. So in six G, the network will sense you. It will basically it will it will send out an RF signal or a field, and it will send, and that information will come back through different sorts of sensors and also through the antenna. So this means that like you can create a, a digital twin of a real world asset. So you know like how Forza um, spent so much money trying to simulate a car. What if the network can simulate every single road condition, any single time? Right. This is like great for this is great business applications because you can now simulate an airplane without actually having to do all the physics right away. But imagine, imagine now like GTA have real world physics and real world map creation all in one. And and even taking a step further, you can start to do avatars of yourself that create that is like somehow. Uh, worlds and feels basically like real life this is like the holy grail of the metaverse so like i don't want to like it's still being discussed um i think the last paper that was fully published was like um mid last year so and i know nvidia only started hiring like two months ago and my team we're going to start talking about it probably in a year from now yeah well I'd interesting be, uh... So you're getting big into D-PIN then? I mean, because I mean that's essentially lining up pretty much exactly with where we're going to be heading with D-PIN and EOT. Uh, I'm I'm really not familiar with those acronyms, but it sounds familiar. It's like some sort of like way you do VR, right? No, dude. D-PIN is d the uh, is is the future. It's a decentralized um, infrastructure, uh, essentially physical network. So you take. Uh, I'll uh, I'll hit you in the back channel. See so if we can we can go through, dude. Like yeah, deep yeah. in yeah, is sure. where it's going to be at, and it's essentially letting people monetize their everyday just kind of movements and where they are, how they're doing things uh, via securing networks with unused bandwidth or unused processing power on their devices. I personally don't think that will ever happen due to legal reasons. But people keep on pushing for it, which I'm like, okay. Um, the thing is, like, I hate to say it, every technically for like security reasons, everybody technically needs to get like, um, you just can't have somebody using your internet, you know, like if in case of an emergency or in case somebody was doing something very sus. Um, and I hate to say it, like, I've seen, I've seen people arrested. Um, for letting somebody use their like internet as in a as a like a DPN, sorry, DPN system. So it's like, like the law is not there yet for it, but I do see like maybe that could be a service offered in the future. But the law is not on your side if you're if you want to uh, if you want to host somebody. Sad to say. So, Bosch Tools, um, they're one of the first like major. As companies that kind of dive into into the deep in um, area, and essentially they're equipping their tools with various sensors that could determine, you know, essentially weather, if for example, or time use, or time spent on job site, or things like that. And by supplying that data to Bosch, um, you essentially can earn rewards or tokens or whatever they're going to ultimately end up offering. Yeah, the deep end thing is going to be a thing. I, I think it's one hundred percent going to be a thing, and I think it's going to be a huge thing. Um, the digital twin thing is really interesting because I've heard the digital twin thing mentioned KNG like several, like over the course of the last several months. When I go into some of these like gigabrain spaces, right, and I hear them talking about digital twins and what they can do with them, and kind of like what they're building, and it, it, it's it's pretty impressive stuff. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, uh, from uh, it sounds like there's so much shit because when I'm looking at it, I'm like, give me the simplified version. It says a digital twin is like a virtual copy of a physical object or system created using real time data and text. So now imagine it as a detailed digital model that mirrors something in the real world, such as a car engine or even an entire building. 
and the model is constantly updated with data from sensors to accurately reflect the current state and performance of its physical counterpart. That's wild. Businesses yep. use digital twins to predict, to predict problems before they happen, plan maintenance, and improve the design and operation of products and systems, making processes more efficient and cost-effective. Sounds like they have a very, very strong use case. Yeah, but yeah, it's uh, right now it's business applications. But um, they are uh, from my talks with like I can't I, I can't I'm like under certain NDAs when it comes to my personal life. But my talks with like some big um, big vendors like Meta and stuff like that, they have a whole new thought process on what they can do with this type of data in the terms of the Meta. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Where, uh, where Kyle go? He disappeared. I was gonna say, what's up, superstar? All right, I got you. I got you. I got you. Um, Vision Pro. I know we had we have Vision. We had Vision Pro week. We didn't really touch on it. Like, who? Which one of you guys ordered a uh, a Vision Pro, and why? And why not? Um, I always order the second generation of whenever a new piece of technology comes out. Um, I like like to let other people trendset and test the beta. But uh, speaking on new VR technology that's come out, have you guys seen the movement system from Disney? Uh, allowing, you know, introducing real uh, locomotive movement into VR games. Holy crap, that is a game changer in my That's mind. huge, dude. I cannot believe, like, I could not, I, I gotta try one. As soon as I saw it, ne- oh, like, I've where, never where seen where anything like it. Yeah, yeah, I've never. I, we've all seen the treadmills, right? With the omnidirectional treadmills where you're pinned in at the waist. Having just a mat where you can, like, it, it smartly automatically moves you back and centers you in and allowing multiple people to be on that map, all a mat, all to be able to deal with locomotive in VR. To me, that's like, that's the holy grail. That's one of the major things that VR has been missing historically. And, you know, at least the videos that I've seen, it seems like this is the most clean and eloquent solution I've ever seen for that issue. Dude, yeah, I, I can't wait to try that at some point. The only, like, like drawback I thought I saw to it was I didn't see anybody moving real fast on it, right? And it's like, if I'm playing a first-person shooter, like, out of instinct alone, like, I'm going to try and move faster than... You're, you're gonna probably going to run. I mean, in the video's defense, the guy demoing it was, you know, in his late 60s, early 70s. So I don't know if they could have even shown it going fast. I think that was about as fast as that guy could go. Um, but I think it's super, super optimistic. I, I you know... I, I, it's going to be very interesting to see where the VR market matures and how Web3 implementation, uh, you know, comes in to the VR market as a whole. There's a couple of cool VR Web3 games out there. You know, Ghost of Tabor is one of them I can think of off the top of my head. Um, it's really interesting to see this whole industry start to expand as we have Web3 gaming really expanding as well. So wait, to explain it to me now exactly. So like, dumb it down for me because I saw the video. What exactly is the person actually walking on? How does it, what is the tech? Like, and how, like, yeah, so I, 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 I don't know. I know I've seen the same video that you did. Uh, what I assume it is, is, you know, those rollers when you go to the beer store and you're like, you're rolling beers on like, you know, little rollers or hot dog rollers that you see at a, 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 a at a, you know, a, a gas station. That's what I see. I believe that they are. And then they have individual motors at each one of the ends of those little rollers. So effectively, you can ro- run on it as fast as you want. But if you start getting off centered, then the rollers can naturally start rolling your feet right back into the middle of the mat, which, you know, is, is pretty mind blowing. That's at least the way that I'm imagining it works. And if it doesn't work like that, then I'm full of crap. Yeah, I think there's something exactly like what you said, because I've been like trying to like dissect this thing too mentally, like how how are they doing this, you know, and like, I think it's like that, like those rollers, and I bet you they have some sort of like pressure weight sensitive type something underneath it, you know, so it's for like, sure, based on like, for sure, and then like your heel to toe or how quickly you're pushing off or something like that, it can adjust the essentially like the resistance on those roller balls. Imagine doing that in live time, man. And, and you know, I, I think without a question, those rollers definitely have little motors attached to them as well. So, because you saw people standing still, or you saw the guy on the chair that's just like magically, it looks like a magic trick of him just moving around this little mat. You know, to me, it's like, I, as soon as I saw that, I was like, okay, VR now is becoming something that's really, really interesting and actually a potential, uh, you know, uh, uh, industry changing event now. Okay, listen up. A little demonstration of it. So, I can walk on this omnidirectional floor in any direction I want. It will automatically do whatever it needs to have me stay on the floor. 
And what's amazing about this is multiple people can be on it and all walking independently. They can walk in virtual reality and so many other things. So where are you hoping this tech ends up? You know, imagine a number of people being in a room, being able to be somewhere else collaboratively and moving around, seeing, doing sightseeing. Imagine theatrical stages that might have these uh, embedded in them so that dancers can do amazing moves. Not me, but <laughs> really good dancers. Um, so there are just so many applications for this type of technology, and we don't know yet where, that, where it will be used. Well, it's the, the funniest thing. I think you probably the have part. one of the coolest oh, jobs. Yeah, I think you're right. It, it gives me an amazing opportunity to use these inventions that I've made in service of people having fun. Well, Lanny, it's been great catching up yeah. with you. Thanks Go for ahead. Around. Yeah, I, I, I just think the funniest thing is like the applications that he listed out are you know, in my mind, the weakest applications of this technology. I see this as a total consumer product, like the Apple Vision Pro. I think we're seeing a lot of the technology companies really start to go into this mixed reality future. Um, and I think, you know, without a question, locomotive and being able to move around in-game has been the sticking point for any one of these experiences. That, to me, is the major application. It's from I, a consumer a, a consumer basis right down to VR doing this. I think... I think the reason why he said that in the beginning, right, is all, uh, is because you got to remember what's uh, Disney's core audience, and number two, um, how much does this thing cost? Like, like I remember, I remember back in college, an omnidirectional wheel that you see on one of those uh, machines cost anywhere at the time was like twenty thousand dollars a tire. So I could only imagine what this cost. But maybe it's Disney. They could probably get it down in mass production. Who knows? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, you know, with, with any technology, right? The Vision Pro is coming out prohibitively expensive for the vast majority of users, right? It's like thirty-eight hundred bucks U.S. as the for the base model. Um, you know, I, 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 I think the people who are in the VR world are willing to spend really, really high, high amounts of dollars, and I certainly think at a mass production scale, what you know, once once all the tooling has been done and once the manufacturing basis has been done. I, I can't imagine this being more than a few thousand dollars at a consumer level. Let me ask you guys a question. Like this, this, this is groundbreaking tech. Like it to like when I look at this floor, maybe this is just me, like my primitive brain, right? Like when I look at this, I'm saying to myself, um, wh like what exactly is this hollow? Like when it says hollow tile floor, it like the does the tech lie in just the ability like to walk? Cause I'm, I'm, I'm looking for it and I, and I'm not seeing it. Right. Like what, what new things can this actually like enable? Like I get it. It's going to allow people to walk. Whereas before, like, you know, you're pretty much standing still, obviously that's, that, that's a huge deal. But I guess, I guess when you talked about like multiple people on it at the same time, <laughs> they didn't look like they were too comfortable. They were like too far apart. It looked like they were going to collide, but it doesn't seem that same either. I, I, well, I, I, I think specifically when he was talking about multiple people, this is like a prototype that they have. So it's a pretty small <laughs> base for them, to, for them, for multiple people to be walking around. But I, I think what he was talking about, those are like room scale experiments, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of those like VR spaces that are, you know, in a warehouse basically, and they have preset experiences that allow multiple people to be particip participating at once. That is, I think, the application there where he's talking about multiple people on one of these mats. Truly, though, the big step here in evolution is the ability to move in a VR space. I don't know if you're a VR gamer. I like to play VR every so often. I have, you know, a few of the headsets. Moving around has always been, at least for me, it makes my stomach sick. It makes me absolutely not want to be a VR gamer because I can't get my VR legs. Um, and it, I've tried over and over and over again. To me, this is like, you know, once you're able to physically move in this space, it, it, it massively increases your immersion and it also massively decreases the, the uh, you know, the debilitating factors that normally comes with VR gaming. Yeah, I think the immersion factor is probably the biggest one, right? I feel like that's what I'm hearing over and over is you ha the game has to feel immersive, right? Like you have to feel that. And, and, and the gripe I hear all the time is people are not buying these headsets, whether it's the Pro or the Quest or whatever, because it's like the, the weight factor and the nausea factor at the end of the day too. So now like you're going to throw this in. I think this is going to be really interesting to see where this goes. Sorry, KNG, go for it, man. I know you had the hype, Mike. Go for it. 
Oh, yeah. So I was about to say the nausea it comes from like three different things. It's the accuracy of the image. So now we have 4K. It's the latency of frames. Now they're doing 120 on the higher end models. And uh, I forgot what the other guy mentioned, but the motion is the next one. So they're slowly tackling this. Um, I think I think also what it is is that we have yet to have a true a true metaverse game that like everybody and their mom wants to participate. And we're starting to get there, but um, but I think over time, like even the processors are getting better. Um, I what does this Apple headset has an M1 in it? That that's like already pretty impressive by itself. So yeah. Yeah, it's pretty impressive stuff. I'm I'm, I'm trying to like read like read a little bit more about it just to really see like what this hollow tile thing like what kind of effect it's gonna do. So let me ask you guys this question, right? Like some of the games like Colin that that you guys are building over there, Thorfi, like with, uh, on the chain, like are you guys in, are gonna be like or even thinking about stuff like this? I mean, we're certainly thinking about it from an infrastructural standpoint. Um, you know, we don't develop games. We're we're developing a you know essentially an AVAC C chain here for gaming. We're providing infrastructure. We're developing tools that bring unique values to gamers and you know uh, uh, gaming projects as a whole. Um, we're not going to create a you know a, a, a implicit bias within our ecosystem by operating our own games um, and you know trying to be direct competitions with some of our launch partners. Um, but certainly. One of the major things that we're looking at as we're developing the Eclipse subnet here is really prioritizing, you know, uh, uh, interoperability between different gameplay experiences. It's already so pseudo addressed through, you know, uh, products like Game Loop that allows users to, you know, burn in-game assets in exchange for assets from other games, uh, you know, to offer token sinks and, you know, a discoverability to new games. But really what we want to do is we want to be able to you know, build that framework and that foundation for the entire gaming industry. And VR is certainly going to be an industry. I think it's going to be expanding. And I think it's going to be expanding mostly through the help of the Apple Vision Pro. Um, as a guy who owns Quest devices, I own, you know, both Quest, all three Quests now. Um, I own, you know, HTC Vive, uh, the HTC Vive. I own a few of the other headsets out there. Um, none of them have had that Apple level of polish. And generally speaking, whenever Apple enters into this industry and they introduce a really, really high quality polished product, that's what drives a lot of the mass adoption, even for people outside of the Apple ecosystem. So from our mind, interoperability and being able to, you know, build our infrastructure with these kind of experiences in mind, um, you know, allows us to be far more agile when these industries start to mature and evolve. Take, take in mind, Apple... Apple doesn't really, Apple doesn't really uh, set trend. Apple doesn't really innovate, but they set trends, right? So like the iPhone, the Nexus came before the iPhone, I believe, right? Uh, they had Bluetooth headphones to that level, I believe. But Apple just makes things popular and creates like, oh, there is a, there is um, there's a user base willing to um, willing to pay at this level. And that create and that pushes other manufacturers just like okay we can we can compete at this level. I like I remember now we're starting to see lu uh, luxury heavy SUVs. Before there was never like that before the Model X. So um, yeah, that's what I think is really happening here. Is that Apple said okay there's enough there's enough uh, users interested in this product that we can actually um, be able to fund some sort of R and D and and now that they created such a high quality product. Don't be surprised that Microsoft released a consumer grade four grand headset. Exactly. Uh, the, 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 that's my whole point, right? Like Apple here takes you know the the, the proof of concepts that that you know other people create and actually innovate, uh, but they bring a finished polished uh, product to market. And whenever they tend to do this, it usually it spells the mass adoption curve for that piece of technology. So it's really optimistic in terms of VR uh, with Apple coming out with a Vision Pro, especially couple that in with this Disney Holomat. Because I'll just be honest, I'm super nerd psyched out about that. Um, um, I, 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 I think we're going to see a, uh, a real resurgence in, uh, in you know, uh, uh, VR-based gaming. Um, and I'm hoping that's going to also evolve into a Web3 context here as well. So I think what, Apple, what happened with Apple is they, they stopped innovating on products after Steve Jobs left and really started innovating more on the tech side. You know, and it's like, 
the iPhone when it came out, I mean, it was really like one of the first of its kind with that form factor and that interface and the iOS and, you know, those things in a mobile form, you know, and it was like really innovative. And we saw a bunch of other phone companies kind of copy them. They used to be really good at going to market first, you know, where it's kind of like an area that a lot of companies don't really want to play in. You know, nobody really wants to go first with a brand new product because like everybody else wants to kind of learn from where it fails. And so with Apple, they used to just really just not give a shit and they would just launch products that they knew were going to be innovative and they had amazing design teams and their marketing is bar none, I think the best in the entire industry, you know, on how they market their products and how they design. I mean, there was over, like well over 10,000 hours that went into the design of the iPhone box, just the box itself. And so if you pick up the top of the box and the bottom slowly slides out at a like in the exact same amount of time across every single box with the exception of you know like you know uh, manufacturer defects things like that but it's like they go into that level of detail into the entire experience of that product you know it's not just like you know, on top of the fact that it's you know a, a phone in your pocket it's also a camera it's also a music it's also you know all of these things they really do the research on the entire experience, or at least they used to, you know, and I feel like where they kind of dropped the ball with the vision pro uh, other than like the absurd price tag. Um, but again, you know, the first iPhone was, you know, insanely expensive and you had to wait in line for six, seven hours just to get it. But other than the price tag, I feel like they dropped the ball on that whole experience that you, that somebody's going to have wearing it. You know, it's like, do you really expect to just sit on your couch and put this thing on your head that's hot it's heavy you know there's a cord attached to a battery pack you know it's like even if it looks great and the design team went into all this custom tech stuff that they did and they have like all all sorts of brand new patents that they were you know that they were approved for they won just for the vision pro you know and so on the tech side of things it's absolutely mind-blowing revolutionary but i don't think it's really going to hit because i think the product itself lacks that innovation lacks that experience innovation because i mean you can really get the same experience with like a, a quest at the end of the day and it's way cheaper good take yo kyler what's good bro yo what up dude how you doing i'm chilling man welcome back superstar how was the trip to hollywood oh big news big things happening Nigel's just one of the first we're super hyped dude the dominoes are starting to fall I like it, man. Congrats, bro. Congrats. Any new updates you want to share with anybody? Uh, well, Nigel's going to be skating in the Summer Olympics for Pog. Let's fucking go. We're going to be out in uh, Paris together in February, the end of February for NFT Paris. He's also got an SLS uh, skate championship. And, you know, there's uh, only about like 600, 700 people who have already got access to this coin, maybe like 500 and 60, 600 or something like that. But uh, we're about to go live with it and, and start sharing it with the world. So uh, we're really excited for people to to start recouping and, and you know, earning and start to see some of this benefit. So pretty excited, man. Nigel, again, is just one of the first, but he's got a number of athletes that he's going to bring on board with us. Uh, he's not just a spokesman, but a marketing advisor and somebody who's actually a part of this team. So he's going to bring on some big talent. And then uh, we've got some Hollywood stuff that's coming up later that we're excited to announce the end of this year. So uh, we're just getting started, man. The coin is just uh, just starting to uh, take shape. Let's go, boy. Let's fucking go. Good shit, man. I'm happy to see this whole thing take shape, man. It's funny, like, when you see something kind of like from, I don't want to say from the very, very beginning, because I probably caught you, like, way after. I mean, your beginning is, like, years and years ago. But it's nice to see a plan get executed, like, the way it's supposed to be executed and, like, things actually go according to plan and go right, man. Like, congrats, bro. This is dope, man. I'm, I'm excited for you guys. Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, it, it feels crazy because it is um, something, you know, it is a big, big step in the right direction to have him on board. And uh, the people that he's got coming up are um, not uh, unknown folks. So it, it's going to be fun. And then who knows what uh, what the next thing's going to be. But yeah, dude, we're just we're just getting it all squared away. So hyped to have a bunch of people in early and uh, really excited to reward those folks that found us before um, before the summer. Let's go. And where do we go? Where, um, as far as like coin goes, um, available to the public just yet? Yes, no. And where do we go? Yeah, yeah. Just go on our website and you can scoop up an arcade pass and that'll have an allocation of coins discounted from the original market uh, cap that we're launching this thing at. 
uh, you know, the pri private sale went so well that we're, we had to allocate some of the coins from the arcade and from marketing to the public sale to make it available for folks. Um, but uh, we're going to have that going probably till the beginning of February, maybe a week or two into February. But um, trading, like you'll be able to start swapping uh, for it beginning next month. And then the first airdrops happen in May. Uh, so May 1st, the first airdrops happen. So um, you can scoop up some pogs. You can scoop up the arcade pass if you want to get in position. But uh, we're, we're going to try and make it rain on everybody who's there early. But, dude, yeah, 200 million collectors around the world remember pog. And that's going to be a huge advantage when we bring this uh, coin to Binance and to these other places uh, over the next year. So uh, super pumped. Ooh, let's go, boy. Drew, what's good? I saw you came up. What's going on, bro? Yo, what's good? Hope everyone's having a good day. Congrats on that pog. That's sick. Thanks, bro. Fuck yeah. Love your mutant. Let's go, baby. Oh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Quick time, real quick. I'm gonna pay some bills. I need y'all to I need y'all to tell me what you think about this because this is just I I got one shot to test this out. It's probably not the best one, but I gotta pay some bills. So check this out. Now a word from your sponsor future of Bitcoin mining with Quantum Expeditions, pioneers from Texas who are shaping the digital currency landscape. With the launch of their exciting new website at quantumexpeditions.com, they're embarking on a bold journey and they're inviting you along for the ride. Their latest project, a profitable mining site, kicked off in the last month of the past year. Now, with an investment starting from a mere hundred dollars, you can join a community pushing the boundaries of Bitcoin mining. But it's not just about the money. There are perks for everyone, from exclusive merchandise to potential dividends for the higher tier investors. It's not just an opportunity to increase your wealth. It's your ticket to the cutting edge of the Bitcoin revolution. Are you ready to be part of something groundbreaking? Begin your adventure in Bitcoin mining with Quantum Expeditions. Visit quantumexpeditions.com today. Burl, footage of people using computers. <laughs> we had to edit the end. But yo... <laughs> Think about that, right? <laughs> Why did he say calm? I just gotta ask. Why did he say Bro, calm? The, the, the comment that was in the ad read. I couldn't help but laugh my ass off when I heard that. But you remember who it was, right? What's the name of the company? Uh, Burl. All I remember was Burl. No. <laughs> guys, you're making it fail me. What is it? DM it to me. I'll pretend like I knew it. DM it no. to me. Quantum Expedition. Quantum Expedition. Shout out Quantum. Let's go. <laughs> Maybe it's the reinforcement that has to come after the video. I don't know what has to happen, but I don't know. I, it's I mean, still get used to it. Just the funnel right at the beginning, so it hits people immediately. Like, what the f? Oh, true. Like as everybody's kind of like piling in, it's like Quantum Expedition. Uh, put it on loop. <laughs> yeah, bro. I mean, look, he he took he took his ad copy really literally, and I shout him out for that. That was on me, by the way. That is not that. that is all all right, I take your I take your reading of that ad copy very literally, and I shout you out for that. <laughs> Yo, Taco, okay. was good. It it says something though, doesn't it? I mean, I think there's a cool narrative here with AI that the more we see it, the more we become uh, recognizant of what it is, and it's silly mistakes and quirks like this one that a uh, an AI can do, as in pretend to be a human, make a mistake of some sort that could trick us into thinking that a lot of these are not AI, and then some sort of silly work around to that problem. But you might be onto something there. I'm telling you, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tweak it to where like. It's going to be my voice. It's going to sound super conversational to where it's just going to be the play of a button. You know what I mean? Like this was obviously done quick, quick with some like free tools or whatever. But you, you take some of this stuff to 11 labs and it's, it's going to be it's going to be massive. And I'm going to combine this with obviously like a lot of the different audiograms that I pull, like some of the sound bites from, like for some of these spaces. And I think it's going to be really powerful stuff for different brands. But, yo, boys. This was super fun. Sorry I was a little bit tired today, man. That last space really fuck it really messed with me, man. Like that that whole shit really got me. So I apologize. I'm all, I was a little off my game today, but I'll bring the hype uh, 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 tomorrow for sure, but I appreciate y'all coming through. Kyler, welcome back. Brett, thank you for freaking co-host. Yeah, for real. Uh Colin, Drew, thanks for coming through. KNG, I really appreciate you coming by, man. Please come by more often, bro. I'd love to have you add yeah. mad value to this panel.